I'll try to review where we are uh, also uh, starting, in fact, uh, from uh, uh, a slide which was uh, some years ago, perspective. So this was in 2009. It was about which were the perspective for crop, pasture, uh, and livestock modeling. And it's interesting to see what has happened since. And you will see a lot has happened through AgMIP, in fact. But still, there are some missing issues. So I will review a bit those. And I will also address uh, how we can see uh, the crop pasture livestock modeling in the context of the integrated assessment modeling. So uh, when we were sitting there some years ago, thinking of what should be done, we were saying, well, we need further model developments, international database, data to model and model to model intercomparison. You can see uh, that uh, this has been taken over indeed by ACMIP. We were thinking also of the quality standards for the data and so on. And here again, it's ACMIP. Uh, something which maybe is not up to our expectations is about the experiments because the funding went down and we did have some more experiments with a combination of drivers, but not as much as we would need, I think. And then we were saying there are many missing issues, issues where we can see these uh, modeling efforts are constrained because they don't well relate to other domains. Could be the soil functioning, could be the water resources, could be uh, the plant pathology or the animal diseases, atmospheric pollution, the farm scale adaptation, and indeed socioeconomics, as we have heard already. So when we start thinking about uh, where we did make a lot of progress, I think, but still have major challenges, is about representing uncertainties. So when we think about the assessment exercise, we can see we start from the emission, we go to the concentration, we go to the climate models, the downscaling, and finally we have those crop pasture livestock models there. And um, you can think of it of an uncertainty cascade. And uh, this, uh, I will not comment on the climate modeling, but, but there are many steps there, obviously. And we were ignoring largely that there were so many uncertainties associated with differences across uh, crop pasture livestock models. So now I think it is well established and pioneered uh, through ACMIP uh, model intercomparison and benchmarking. So if we go to the neglected issues, uh, it is uh, a bit of a concern to realize we are still having a number of uh, what I would call uh, often neglected issues that may have uh, negative impacts on what we are assessing or sometimes positive impacts also. So you can see we have indeed a lot more attention in our days about extreme events. I think the water scarcity issue is very important and I will go back to this. Ozone, pests and diseases, soil degradation, uh, partly covered I think uh, in AGME, but still many unknowns. We heard already animal heat stress is one for livestock. We heard about the links uh, with the nutrition and uh, micronutrients is one. Uh, I just uh, spotted one about uh, heat stress for agricultural workers. I mean, people in uh, assessing uh, the impacts of climate change on uh, um, um, yeah, labor forces uh, tell you that there will be constraints and this would actually feed back possibly on the practices. Now, what are the positive uh, impacts? Well, we still have a key uncertainty with the carbon dioxide. We know of the uh, impacts of elevated CO2 uh, uh, on productivity, but then there is an interaction with nutrients, and the way we uh, have this interaction uh, modeled is uh, not uh, very obvious. Uh, and I, I listed a few others. I don't have time to spend uh, much uh, on, uh, say, increase of nitrogen fixation, possibly with the rise in CO2, uh, many changes in vegetation for pastures, and the major positive impacts are expected from technology and adaptation, and I will go back to those. So quickly, um, an issue about the effect of carbon dioxide on uh, the productivity has to do with the effect on photosynthesis. And I just wanted to point again in that study uh, that for crops, oops, sorry, I don't uh, navigate this very well, I'm afraid. Uh, mm -mm -mm. Yeah, I'll do it like this. Uh, for crops, you can see this large error bar. And uh, I think that our understanding is like, uh, if you have a good uh, nutrient availability, you will not have a lot of uh, um, long-term acclimation, meaning that the CO2 effect will remain quite positive. However, if you have deficiency in nitrogen for phosphorus for your crops or pastures, you may go down and have less of the CO2 effect. Representing this adequately in models is still quite difficult. Another important uh, factor is uh, te the temperature thresholds, and that's an example from the work by John Porter and colleagues for wheat, and they published a bit 
uh, this for other species now, do we really well represent uh, those uh, temperature thresholds at the different phenological stages? And uh, what are the implications with climatic variability, with climate extremes? That's another one where we should uh, have more attention. And this was pointed to in a recent report of an expert group. Uh, uh, obviously, interactions with water availability are just uh, key to the full system. And uh, this is the uh, impacts of climate change depending uh, on whether you have uh, corn with rain-fed systems or irrigated systems. And uh, obviously, uh, the impacts are expected to be bigger on the rain-fed than irrigated. But how much do you see uh, the, uh, in this uh, sort of modeling? What are the impacts in uh, the decline of the water tables on the availability of water for irrigation? We are quite unsure that this is well represented currently. And in the same way, uh, there are many issues of scale in coupling with hydrology. For instance, uh, sometimes we would assume that there is water beneath the root zone, uh, but this here again will depend on how the hydrology is modified. Uh, so even in the rain-fed system, we need to take far more attention about that coupling with hydrology. Uh, so we are actually trying in Europe to, to get some action on that side to get uh, some uh, coupling uh, of the models with hydrology. And this will be, I think, uh, supported by a new uh, ERANET, sort of European uh, large uh, project on climate uh, uh, services, uh, where we foresee a development of uh, services also for adaptation and mitigation. And there we can connect the needs from different stakeholders, uh, people in the water sector, in the farming sector, but also obviously uh, public uh, decision uh, makers. Um, and that's something also we are working for in France, and we, we try to foresee a web portal. So this would be uh, a way also uh, to uh, have uh, some of our integrated assessments uh, being used by stakeholders. I'd like now to go on and to see what are the connections with the integrated assessment, because I think that's an important discussion point. Uh, I'm always a bit concerned about the way we look at technology as a modifier of the projections of the crop uh, pasture livestock models linking to uh, the economics. And uh, we can say that uh, technology adjusted to GDP or to research and development spending is uh, modifying uh, the outputs of the model. And I believe these uh, modifiers have an overwhelming role in uh, future projections of food supply in the integrated assessment models. So there are questions about how could we endogenize technology changes in our models. There are questions also about, is there something equivalent to a potential productivity? Can we assume that technology will always rise yields or will we reach a ceiling value here? It's a delicate question really, because we know of the genotype type environment types management interactions and they may imply that there is no really ceiling value to the agroclimatic potential. Um, if we look into uh, some exercise we, we were doing with YASA in a European project, uh, this is how the GDP per capita, according to the SSPs, uh, is playing a role on the development of crop yields. So, yeah, there may be such relationships, but they are, to me, quite vague. They are not extremely well constrained. Uh, so uh, I think we would need a lot of progress on those things. We've been doing the sa same for an important parameter for the livestock, which are the feed conversion efficiencies. It's interesting because it's not exactly symmetric to uh, the yields. If you talk about an efficiency, it cannot go above one, obviously. So it is at least constrained by something. <laughs> uh, but so when you do this, you realize for Europe, maybe for beef and poultry, we are pretty close to ceiling values. So we can go a bit higher, but not so much. Then in Africa, you can go far higher, presumably. And you have to factor in also the changes in the livestock production systems. So how do we do all this is really key to uh, our projections, I think. So I would call technology deus ex machina. You know, that was uh, in the Greek theater. At the end, there was a god which was just uh, above all the scene and it was uh, uh, just constraining the issue. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, I don't know what happens there, yeah. Um, in any case, uh, if we think uh, of, uh, uh, there are some missing, uh, that's the problem with the Mac, I, shifting to, from Windows to Mac, uh, yeah, didn't work. In any case, on that slide, I was showing a graph where uh, we can see uh, the past increase in the uh, technology for both uh, the primary production, plant production, and second, for the conversion of production by livestock. 
And it is important to say that there has been a 50% gain in the production efficiency, uh, sorry, the conversion efficiency of primary proteins to uh, livestock proteins uh, over 1960 to uh, 2010. Uh, and this is often neglected in the way we think about uh, the food system. Um, I hope this works. Um, so this brings me to uh, really the challenges for the next uh, years. I think uh, obviously we need to deal far more with increasing risks uh, from climatic variability and associated price volatility. And r remember, in many of the models, they are not well suited right now to take the interannual variability. They take means over time slices of 10 years or something like this. The increased risks of epidemics, that's something to be considered. We may have spread of animal diseases, of plant diseases, and this may create shocks to the system. Uh, there are also demands, oh, come on, demands on the sector uh, from, uh, sorry, I have problems with all this. Um, changes in the sector uh, with uh, demands for having drastic greenhouse gas mitigation. Uh, if uh, we look into uh, the future, uh, it is likely that the agricultural sector at one stage may be 30 to 50 percent of global emissions if we are serious about the two degrees Celsius uh, target. And uh, I think we will be faced by extreme pressure from other sectors asking for, rap for rapid mitigation in our sector, and this may create some uh, changes. Um, so we, we heard already of the pressures on environmental resources, the uh, stories about nutrition and micronutrients. So we will need to uh, model resilience of food systems, not only adaptation of agricultural production. And we need, need to model the implication of rapid mitigation for uh, our systems and hence for climate change impacts and adaptation. So this is a view from the insurance in industry. The Lloyds have an emerging risk report each year and this year, it was about uh, our sector, about agriculture. Just have a look at their worst case scenario for our sector. They say there would be a large ENSO event, so uh, losses in production by 7 to 10 percent on some of the major grain crops. And uh, they also predict that this could lead uh, to, in their worst case, to uh, increased uh, impacts from crop pathogens. And uh, with this, they find some very dire consequences for food security. The rice prices uh, are expected in their study to be multiplied by a factor of five. Can you just imagine the magnitude of the impacts of this? And uh, obviously also the stock values would go down uh, in, in many countries. Uh, I'm just pointing at this not to, to tell you that I believe it. I, I don't think it's just an expert uh, study and uh, they didn't use any quantitative tools really. But really, are we able to do this? That's my point. I'm afraid not. I'm afraid not. Our current sets of models cannot replicate uh, those scenarios, and we do need to answer questions uh, on this. Uh, just another example is about resilience to extreme events. These are hurricane impacts in Central America, uh, and these were on monocultures here and uh, on uh, so-called agroecological terraces uh, in uh, the bottom. So you can see the impacts were less uh, in those systems because they were having soil conservation, they were having a, a diversity of crops, and apparently they were more resilient. So investigating those changes which are required for increasing resilience will be more and more of an issue. And here again, our modeling is maybe not set to do this right now. So when we think about what it means about adaptation and resilience strategies, it's a risk management, isn't it, issue. So there is a self-retention layer where farmers can cope with some of the existing variability. Then usually you have insurances that could take over for another uh, part of the variability. And then you may have very negative uh, impacts where it's a market failure layer. Uh, so what sort of adaptation can we think of? It is presumably uh, incremental adaptation here. Then you have some risk of changes in the system, systemic changes. And here it's rather transformation of your systems. So I guess we are already organized to study this. Maybe this. I'm not sure we are organized in our modeling efforts to understand what are the transformative changes. And it could be, by the way, that some of those in some countries actually would be uh, moving more out of the classical paradigm of uh, eco-efficiency 
to a different paradigm of uh, agroecology, having uh, more mixtures, you know, for instance, and uh, more of the soil conservation. Um, <clears throat> so this is another example now uh, to try to comment on how mitigation could feed back on our systems and on climate change impacts. This is a study we had from our government on uh, what would it take to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions in France by, say, 20 to 30 percent. And these are the measures. It's a classical mitigation abatement cost curves. On the x-axis, you have the technical potential, uh, the tons of carbon dioxide which would be avoided. And on the y-axis, you have the price. So these are costs. And these are actually, surprisingly, negative costs, meaning that farmers would be in theory, better off by doing those changes, but they don't do it. So the reasons are a bit more complex than one would think. Some of those changes are just very simple. They would save some nitrogen fertilizers, so do some e have economies there. But some of the changes are a bit disruptive. They are about agroforestry. They are about conservation agriculture. They are about uh, really uh, a bit system changes. So if we are serious about having mitigation in our systems, this means that we will end up having uh, changes in the farming systems that would uh, alter their sensitivity to climate change. And one of the big changes here is about soil organic matter because uh, the IPCC uh, Working Group 3 uh, shows that uh, uh, the soil carbon buildup can contribute up to 89% of the total technical mitigation potential of agriculture. And uh, here again, if we think on how we would move to have more of the soil organic matter buildup and restore degraded soils, it has also large consequences for climate change impacts and adaptation. Um, so I'll jump to the perspectives. Sorry for having a part of my presentation not available. I will make sure it's available with a PDF afterwards. Uh, in any case, um, here would be uh, the perspectives. We, we need to uh, go to have uh, a modeling of the changes that may happen with climate smart agriculture, linking adaptation and mitigation. And this is beyond incremental technology changes. We need to assess food systems, not only agricultural production. And uh, climatic variability will be a central issue as well as the health issues. So we had a very good presentation on this. Um, this means also that we need to explore multiple future scenarios. Uh, we cannot I think, stay with only uh, low, medium, high climate change impacts. It's far more complex than this. And how to do this is uh, not very clear. We may require some more aggregated approaches calibrated by backcasting uh, in order to avoid all the complexity we currently have in our approaches, which means what I fear is that we would concentrate on just a few scenarios with highly complex suits of models, and we would neglect all the uh, possible futures uh, and I will just show a few examples. We need to test disruptive scenarios. How can we test a 10% drop in global yields in worst case years? That's one. How can we test a three quarter reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture by 2050? It's another one. How can we uh, uh, have a nutritionally balanced global diet by 2050? This is very much in line with uh, what you have said. And uh, should we also think about uh, reduction in agricultural land use to have more bioenergy and so on? So testing those scenarios would be extremely important to me. And I realize it's difficult, so I, I'm just questioning a bit the tools we're having. And uh, here is a beautiful graph uh, from a drawing from uh, Escher. And uh, I, I was thinking, reflecting on uh, how we were developing our assessments. So you see, we start here with something which is just in the framing. We design it gradually to have some refined assessments. And it's nice because you have also a coverage of the landscape with uh, many different types of uh, possibilities. And it can go in the negative side or the positive side uh, to be uh, white and dark, white and black, or in between. <laughs> Thanks.